Hi, everyone. So my name is Akshay. This is Thomas. And we're going to be presenting on dynamic pricing at Lyft and how we use Flink to compute prices in real time. Uh, so a brief agenda. We're going to talk about dynamic pricing at first, what it is and why we do it, and how it can seem kind of counterintuitive at first. Then we're going to talk about our legacy infrastructure, how we used to compute dynamic prices. We'll move on to the streaming infrastructure, how we're using Flink and Beam, and how Beam made like a Python Flink infrastructure possible. And then Thomas is going to talk about Beam, the portability framework, and how it enables multiple languages to use a runner like Flink. So first, a quick plug on the various ways Lyft uses streaming. So there's the pricing team, which of course will be the focus of this talk. We use streaming both for model execution and for real-time supply and demand curves. There's also the fraud team, where they use streaming to detect bad actors in real time. For example, maybe an actor enters multiple credit cards at the same time. That's usually a red flag. There's also the core experience and user delight teams, and they use streaming for things like early delay detection, passenger notification. So an introduction to dynamic pricing. The what it is is actually pretty simple. It means that your price is changing dynamically. Specifically, it changes based on your origin destination if you're a passenger, and it might change minutely. But the reason we do it is less simple. And if you think about it, most industries don't have dynamic pricing. It would be pretty bizarre if you were like in the drive-through line and your price kept changing and you had to you know, time your order or something. But with dynamic pricing, that's actually the case. And often consumers don't like that. But we still feel like it's necessary to do dynamic pricing because driver efficiency is affected so much by market balance. So by market balance here, I mean the distribution of passengers and drivers. And making sure that these two things are balanced in practice has an effect of almost 5 to 10% on driver efficiency. And so when drivers are more efficient, drivers get paid more, more rides are done, more money flows through Lyft, and everyone wins. So I'm going to dive a bit more deeply into why market state affects driver efficiency so much. So in the two pictures, we see the two different worlds of too much available supply, supply being drivers, and too little available supply. So in the upper right picture, we see a lot of available supply and a passenger in that top right corner of San Francisco. So the passenger requests a ride, and the nearest driver is dispatched. So the passenger and that driver enjoy pretty short pickup times, and both of them are pretty happy. But there's a ton of drivers here who are waiting around, so overall driver utilization is low. In the lower right picture, we see the opposite case. There's very little available supply, so most drivers are in fact busy. But because there's so little available supply, as passengers pop up randomly on a map, the expectation of the distance between the passenger and the driver grows. So here, the pickup time grows really large. And that's essentially wasted time for both the passenger and the driver. But there's some happy medium between these two cases where there's enough available supply that pickup times are low, but little enough that drivers aren't spending a lot of time waiting around. And so the way we adjust for this is we can use price as a lever. If we think that the request rate is growing too large, that it would deplete available supply, we can quickly increase its prices to throttle the request rate. And in that way, we can keep the market balance and keep efficiency high. So what is prime time? Prime time is Lyft's product that does the dynamic pricing. The belief behind the prime time model is that there exists some set of optimal price multipliers for each location time bucket. And in practice, prime time prices a certain multiplier for every geohash 6 for every minute. So a geohash 6 is a location bucket roughly equal to 2 blocks by 2 blocks. The geohash system in general, there's like 32 geohash 6s and a geohash 5, and it goes like that. And so the scale at which we operate is roughly 3 million geohashes every minute, which intuitively might not sound like that much. But when you consider the complicated interaction effects between the geohashes and the fact that supply in certain geohashes is almost always dispatched to uh, passengers and other geohashes, you get a sense for the scale of interaction and the difficulty of the machine learning problems. And an example of prime time might be in 9Q8YYV, which is the geohash that Lyft's headquarters is in. Maybe prime time is 2.0 at 5.01 PM. That would mean that if I request a ride between 5.01 and 5.02, and I'm in that geohash, I'm going to end up paying double the ordinary price. So what's difficult about prime time as a problem? There's kind of two big difficulties, one on the engineering side and one on the machine learning side. On the engineering side, and the side that's especially applicable to streaming, we really want low latency information about supply and demand. If we're trying to keep the market balanced, but we only know what supply and demand looked like 
you know, 30 seconds or several minutes ago, it's pretty difficult to do this, especially because certain demand shocks, like a concert ending, can deplete available supply very quickly. The other difficulty is on the machine learning side, which is that pricing is an unsupervised problem. So what that means is that we never actually observe the correct answer. We never observe what the true optimal price is for a given ride, and as a result, it's difficult to train models that attempt to predict that optimal price. The way we get around that is we break down this problem of given supply and demand predict price into many different machine learning models, and these models can depend on each other. So it's always gonna be the case that the last model in this dependency graph is gonna be an unsupervised problem, outputting price, but there might be intermediate problems that are doing supervised problems. For example, here, some model might predict the distribution between available supply and pickup times. In general, as available supply increases, pickup time drops, but a model that can parameterize this would be very helpful for some end model. Uh, so now we'll talk about the legacy pricing infrastructure. So you can see in the picture on the right, there's kind of two clouds, and those represent two different types of boxes. We have listener boxes, which listen to events that come in through Kinesis, and these events are all driven by app events, like if a passenger opens an app, we consider that demand. If the driver app pings us, and the driver app pings us regularly, we consider that supply. And so this listener box listens to these events, and pretty much naively writes these events into Redis minute buckets. The other type of box is a worker box. And so that worker box is either running an aggregation logic, which reads from those minute buckets and writes back aggregated features, or it can be running a model, which means it reads some of those features from the database, executes a model, and writes back the output into that database. And that output can either be the prime time, which is the end output, or it can be output that is meant to be used as features for some other model. And just as an example of scale, I mentioned earlier that we have about three million geohashes that we price every minute. There are also about 100 intermediate features for every geohash. So that's roughly 300 million things being computed every minute. So what are the problems with that legacy architecture? The biggest problem is latency. As I mentioned, those worker boxes are executing at the top of every minute. They're essentially on cron jobs. But this is a problem when some models can depend on other models. Because if you think about it, if one model depends on another and they both start at the same time, then the model that depends on the other will probably not be able to read on the other model's output. It'll have to read the previous minute's output. And if you get some dependency chain, then we add a minute of latency at every step in that chain. And so we can see that streaming would be a much better solution to this problem because in some streaming solution, a model could execute as soon as its dependencies are ready. Another big problem with the old infrastructure is code complexity. So a lot of logic that streaming could handle for us, for example, Flink will do windows and aggregation for us, we've had to do ourselves using fairly complicated like Redis key bucket logic. And so that adds a lot of complexity, it adds a lot of room for error, and essentially it'd be much better to handle this with Flink, which can handle it more efficiently. A third problem is that it's pretty difficult to add new features involving windowing and joining. Uh, basically, every time we wanna add a feature, I mentioned that we have almost 100 features per geohash, we would have to add windowing and joining logic on that feature, whereas Flink could handle that for us and we'd have to do almost no extra work. And a final problem is with respect to dynamic or smart triggers, or essentially arbitrary new features that we might not wanna add to the, like the graph itself. So you can imagine that if a concert ends, maybe demand spikes. And since demand is spiking, we actually wanna trigger the model execution early instead of waiting for the next minute start. There's really no way to do that on the cron architecture. But with Flink, we can define arbitrary triggers on Windows, and this would be not too difficult to do. Uh, so can we use Flink? And this is where we start running into some difficulties. So pictured here is the Lyft streaming stack. At the very bottom level, you see the basic Lyft technologies. One level higher, we see the Lyft technologies that run on streaming and Flink. Uh, but the technologies you see there, which are Kafka and Kinesis, we're transitioning towards Kafka for message passing. We use Flink primarily for our stream execution. But there's some disconnect, because at the very top, you see Pandas, Motplotlib, NumPy, Scikit, and particularly TensorFlow. These are all Python technologies, and the pricing team works almost exclusively in Python. But there's a disconnect there between what Flink expects, which is JVM, Java, or Scala. Uh, so diving a bit more into that problem, there's this disconnect between the machine learning world, which prefers Python or some dynamic language, and Flink, which prefers JVM or some statically typed language, basically Java or Scala. Uh, 
So we can't really use Jython because Jython doesn't give us a lot of capabilities. And we don't want to transfer all of our code and models to Java for several reasons. One, because that would be just a lot of work. Another, because TensorFlow in Java isn't really built out. It's mostly just for like, loading in models and executing. And so we really want some system that will let us use Python on Flink. Ideally, we wouldn't have to change our models at all, and we can just transmit everything with some interface between the two. So that's where Beam comes in. Thomas is going to talk a lot more about this, but Beam gives us an interface between our Python code and models to execute and the data flow Flink graph. Beam allows these two worlds to communicate. So what does our new infrastructure look now that we're using Flink underneath Beam? It's pretty similar to the old infrastructure in the sense that apps are still generating events that are flowing through Kinesis, soon to be Kafka. Those events now enter this filter events box, and at that event, at that box, this is where a Flink graph starts. So in the filter events box, the Flink graph takes in events, it makes internal service calls, and that's primarily to dedupe bad actors. So basically, we'll make calls to the fraud service, we'll see which of these are bad actors, because we don't want to get artificial demand or supply. Then it'll go into aggregation and windowing logic. But here's where it differs, because the aggregation and windowing logic is handled for us by Flink. Uh, finally, it goes to running models, and we've simplified it here in one box. But really, that run model box is itself a DAG. There are many models, some of which depend on each other. But now, a model that depends on other models can run as soon as its dependencies are finished, instead of waiting for the start of a minute naively. And at the very end, the final prime time output that's the price multiplier for every geohash, can still be written to Redis, where we can serve it with the exact same code paths. So just a bit more details. We have that filtering logic where we call the fraud service, and that gives us bad actors and lets us filter out those events. We do aggregation primarily with one minute and five minute windows. So an example feature might be, what's the average observed pickup time for every geohash in the last five minutes? We use triggers for our joins, or triggers for our windows, uh, mostly with watermarks and event time based, but we also use some stateful processing for more advanced triggers. We see a similar story for joins. So we use co-groups when we're willing to join just at the end of a window, but we might also use stateful processing to join on more advanced logic. And this is particularly notable for our model execution when we want a model to execute as soon as its dependencies are finished. So then state can track which dependencies are finished and fire the model early as needed. Uh, the fifth point here is the machine learning models are invoked within Beam transforms, and this is really the meat of why we wanted to use Beam, because we didn't have to change the machine learning models at all. We were able to still execute arbitrary Python code, including things like TensorFlow, within a Flink graph. And the sixth point here is that the final prime time per geohash output is written to Redis, and it can be served with the exact same code paths as before, still in Python. And so now onto the gains that we experienced by moving to the streaming infrastructure. So the biggest gain we got, which I touched on earlier, was related to latency. So now that a model can run as soon as its dependencies have finished, rather than only running at the top of every minute, we lose the old problem of getting a minute of latency at every step in that model DAG. So we've reduced the latency from about three minutes to closer to 30 seconds. And what's especially notable here is that 30 second latency is dominated by model execution. These models are pretty large, and they're essentially running at a region level, or a region is pretty similar to a city. And so because of the complicated interaction effects, the models themselves are heavy. But the actual amount of time that's being used for flink movement is very little. We were also able to reuse model code entirely, which is really helpful for the migration. So model code wasn't changed at all, and the vast majority of library code also wasn't changed. Uh, in terms of lines of code, we saw a really significant reduction, and that was because windowing and aggregation logic and feature computation logic in general is so much simpler in Flink when averages and windows are just handled for us. And finally, because Flink was able to parallelize much better than our old infrastructure, we were able to reduce the number of AWS instances we got pretty significantly, which saves cost in the long run. So now I'm going to turn it over to Thomas, who's going to talk about the Beam portability framework. Thanks, Akshay. Um, so let's take a peek under the hood um, how this happens that Python can run on Flink. Whoops. So the Beam vision is that you have a choice of languages and the choice of execution engines uh, to run pipelines, to author and to run pipelines. And there is this distinction between language SDK, 
and execution engine. Um, end users work with an SDK, they write the pipeline, and they choose an engine on which to run. And uh, the key here is portability or the freedom to move between either of the two. Um, choose the language that is most appropriate for your use case. Um, and then choose the execution environment regardless of which language you have written your application to execute it. So the multi-language support story in Beam is um, Beam became, uh, entered the incubator of the Apache Software Foundation in 2015 and at that time it was a Java SDK and it was Java runners, really. In 2016, work started to um, enable portability, as I said, this grander vision. And this is a large effort that spans across years. In uh, 2017, uh, the first uh, SDK besides Java was added, and that was Python, and it was only work on Dataflow. Um, portability, remember, not in place yet, not finished. Uh, last year, Go SDK was added, and it was the first SDK that would be based on the portability framework. Um, so that means it would run on any runner that supports portability, if there was any. Uh, last year also, the work on Flink gathered steam and uh, a new Flink runner, besides the old one, which is already there, um, which was always there, a new portable Flink runner that can run portable pipelines, um, reach the MVP uh, stage. So now we can take an SDK that supports portability and run it on a runner that supports portability, and we want to run Python on Flink, and we are happy. Uh, there is still some work to do, um, because we also want to be able to mix and match both worlds. We want to take the good things from Java and the good things from Python, put them together in one pipeline and run it. And this specifically applies for I.O. connectors, as you can imagine. It's a large ecosystem of I.O. connectors. It takes time to mature these things. So the most obvious use case, I would like to take a Kafka connector or Kinesis connector or something else and connect that to my <coughs> Python UDF transforms and run my use case. And that's the ideal scenario. So here's an example of a pipeline that is written in Python, a simple pipeline, but kind of typical. We're reading from a source, we define our windowing, we apply triggers that define when outputs are uh, emitted. Um, what do we do? We combine, we have a combined per key here, which is a group by key and the sum really underneath the covers, that's what we compute, and then we write the results somewhere. So this is just to get a feel, what would you write if you were to write a Python program using the Beam SDK. So now for the portability, as it started, there was only Java and Java-based runners. You, the SDK would translate the pipeline into a Java graph that is understood by the runners. So far, so good. Uh, the problems come when a new SDK is added that is not JVM-based, um, how to do that, and then the Python SDK was that first SDK and it was translated with a special case translation to run only on cloud data flow. Fast forward to where we are now, we have a few runners that support portability and we have SDKs that can create portable pipelines or more specifically protobuf structures that are language agnostic that can be translated by those runners without understanding the SDK language. And here we are interested in Flink, of course. Clicker doesn't play. So let's take a look at the Flink runner. Um, as a user, you write your pipeline, and then you submit your pipeline like you would launch any other Python program. And the special parameter that's interesting here is an endpoint to a job service. The job service is the runner. The runner is written in a different language. That's why it's an endpoint. It's a service interface. The pipeline is translated into the protobuf structure. It is given to the Job service, the Flink runner will translate this into something that Flink understands. It will uh, create, depending on whether it's batch or streaming, it will create a data set or data stream um, based job graph. That job graph will be given to a Flink cluster. The Flink cluster looks like you would expect it. It has a job manager, task managers. The only thing that's different here is there are these Python processes. Those are new. Um, they are there because we need to execute the Python Code. That's the point of the exercise. We want to run 
Python code in a native environment, so there needs to be a Python process. To do that, these Python processes, they need to communicate with the runner, with Flink. And uh, this is governed by the FN Services API that consists of several planes uh, to drive the data processing and the control of that execution. At Lyft, we contri contributed to the development of the portable Flink runner, but we also had to make a few customizations uh, to enable this for our use case. The first one is we don't have any streaming sources in the Python SDK yet. Uh, the, the goal is to have the Java sources available for Python in the future, and that is being worked on. So, but we have done our own translation that allows us to use the same sources that we already have for Java Flink jobs, because we already invested so much time into those as well to make them work at scale in production. So we found a way to wrap those sources uh, into uh, the Beam uh, model and be able to use the uh, Java Flink connectors. Uh, they handle the message decoding as well, and as well as watermarks. The second piece is the SDK workers. So those are processes that run on the task manager boxes, host machines. Uh, in Beam, those are Docker processes by default, which is a very nice uh, way uh, to generically distribute dependencies and run them on many environments. In Lyft, we don't have Docker on our deployment, and but we do have already all the Python code on our host machines. So all we need to do is we can run Python processes directly. And this is the other customization. If you are interested in details, the link to our fork, public fork is there. You can take a look at those pieces. So now the next, because this is essential to portability, is how do these workers talk to runners? And if you are interested in this, I would highly recommend to look at this presentation from the Beam Summit last year from Robert Bradshaw that goes into the details. But uh, to get a little glimpse of it here, we have Flink runner on the left side, we have SDK worker on the right side. Um, the runner at some point during deployment is responsible to bring up these processes. Uh, once the SDK worker is running, it will take the provided endpoint, connect back to the runner, and establish a control channel. The control channel enables the runner to tell the worker what to do. And the runner will say, hey, here I have some Python functions. I want you to work with those functions and some additional instructions to set everything up. Then uh, bundles will start. Bundle is a unit of work in Beam. Uh, think of it as a group of records that, that are um, processed in a common context. Not a patch, it's just a grouping. Once uh, the bundle has started, the worker can now go and get the data um, because we need to stream the data from the runner to the worker. So data streams over to the worker. The worker has already the Python UDFs. Uh, it has unpickled them and set them up and prepared them, can compute results. So we have Input, re input records flowing from runner to worker, and then we have result records flowing from the worker back uh, to the runner. And this continues. Um, during that time, we can have multiple bundles process in parallel. Uh, we can have other bundles with other UDFs process in the same worker, because these are shared between Flink operators. And we end with, the, with a scenario where a lot of work is being done, and the data channel is multiplexed between multiple bundle executions. Uh, at some point, the runner will be interested what the status of the work is. It will check for progress. The SDK worker can respond. Uh, as part of that, it can also provide metrics that allow it to monitor the execution. When everything is done, uh, the channel will be. Before that, there's actually the option that we need state to. So uh, state is something that the Flink runner manages. So a worker can go at any point during execution and fetch state. And logging, same thing. Uh, all logging is forwarded to the Flink runner. When a bundle is finished, that is indicated by the end of the stream. And um, at that point, the channels can be closed and the work is finished. So this is really, there are a lot of details behind this, um, but this is on a high level how it works. And uh, then the question that comes up is, what's the performance? We have this extra process and all this chat between runner and uh, worker, what can we expect? Um, so this is a 
small pipeline. This is just a measure overhead. It has a source, it has a number of record by record processing steps that do nothing in this case. It has a window, it has a group by key, which results in a shuffle in Flink, and it has a count at the end. So the functionality is not very interesting, but the processing rate that we can achieve is, and uh, how we get there. So the first um, interesting part is here, you see multiple Python transforms in a sequence. These are collapsed together by Beam. They become one Flink operator. They're called executable stage. That means we don't have to go for each step repeatedly over the FN API to execute, so number one. The second piece is bundle size. Um, if we don't have, for every record, we have, if every record was a bundle, this would be really slow. And this is actually how we started, and it was very slow. Um, after having multiple record bundles, and by default that's 1,000 in Flink, one, either 1,000 records or one uh, second worth of data, um, as part of one bundle, performance gets a huge boost. And the final piece for Python SDK workers is because Python can only run one thread at a time uh, due to the global interpreter lock. We have to run multiple workers uh, to exploit the parallelism that Flink provides with threads. So for a Flink task manager, there will be multiple workers to match the parallelism um, that we need. Then there are other things that can be done with Python itself. We can use Cytan extension, we can use protobuf C++ bindings, and the overhead Figure, if you are interested in that, that was measured by, with a pipeline that was Java on both sides uh, by engineers in Google. So what does that really mean? Um, we want to know that we can run a Python code in a manner that is sufficient uh, for us from, an, uh, from a performance perspective, right? So we want to get a good CPU utilization on the system, and then we want to see a good throughput. Um, tested this on a machine with 16 uh, virtual core and 32 gigabyte of RAM and 16 SDK workers per machine to match the cores. Um, the bundles 1000 milliseconds or 1000 records, whichever comes first. And per machine we can get a processing rate of 280,000 transforms per second or 17,500 per SDK worker. You can probably get a much higher rate if the SDK was Java. Um, and you can probably get a much higher rate if it's a Java pipeline that gets executed without extra process. But that's not the point here. We want to know uh, whether we can run Python code fast enough. Um, and uh, processing rates that we see in Python services and other Python services at Lyft, they are probably more in the single digit thousands or few hundred per second, depending on what we are running. And that's, think of machine learning models and scoring, those are complex operations, uh, they take CPU cycles. And so we wanna be able to accommodate that. And as we see with, with, with the overhead rate here, we can comfortably run Python code um, efficiently. It would be interesting to do a similar analysis for Java in the future. So recap, portability, we can have pipelines that are written in other languages that uh, cannot run on a JVM and we can execute them on runners that are JVM based. And here we care about Python and Flink. We get the full isolation of user code and these are separate processes. There is no restrictions on the library that we use. We can optimize whatever we can do for Python. And, uh, the execution of the processes is also flexible. Like I said, we have customized this to not use Docker. If the runner language and the SDK language matches, it can also be executed embedded, which is certainly an interesting option once we take the Java side and think about how we can run this over the portability layer. Um, then we have multiple languages in a single pipeline, or rather I would say that's what we want to have. Um, we kind of have this due to our customizations of the connectors, but it will be available in a, shortly in, in Beam for all of the Beam IOs uh, that already exist in Java that is being worked on. And there are some other use cases for that as well. In terms of capabilities, the Flink runner is most complete when it comes to portability right now and in combination with the Python SDK. So we always need to see the combination of runner and SDK. So Flink plus Python looks good. Um, Go still needs work. 
other runners still need some work for portability. Um, lessons learned. And this is more from the team's perspective that worked uh, for the first time on a streaming platform. Um, the platform was built while the application was built, so that was one challenge, of course. Uh, it was evolving, there were bugs to fix, and so on. Um, another learning is uh, with a naive approach of um, composing a pipeline without consideration of how such a thing executes on a distributed processor, we can end up with a very efficient lay inefficient layout with a lot of extra operators and shuffles. So some experience and knowledge is required to come up with a pipeline design that uh, is also efficient on a, from a runtime perspective. Um, perhaps more interesting is that stateful processing is really essential and needed. And initially, it wasn't available in the Python SDK that was recently enabled. The ability to use to work with state and timers uh, and have the full control, Stefan talked about this during the keynote. Uh, that's really important for this type of use case because it's not, it's, it's something that requires programming. It's not something that can be solved with a SQL statement, for example, and then we need that control. We use it for the model execution to uh, have complex triggers uh, that fire as soon as possible versus waiting for watermarks or processing time. Um, the model execution latency was already covered by uh, Akshay, uh, why that matters. Uh, another point here is when working uh, with a platform that's completely new or where the user is new to the platform, it always helps to have good monitoring and good metrics uh, to troubleshoot and uh, isolate issues. So that was uh, something uh, that was improved over time. Then the story for upgrading the pipeline, for restarting the pipeline needs some thinking if this is a stateful application and we want to make changes uh, to the code. And then finally, dependencies. It's not just a flink job that runs here. It's, um, it's um, the, the full system consists of a pipeline and other systems that it depends on, other services. So there are rate limits and other considerations that need to flow in uh, for capacity planning. With that, um, if you are interested in what we do, um, Lyft Data Platform has several open positions and uh, check it out. And we have a few minutes for questions. No questions? Oh, question over there. Um, so we considered using something like that, and we actually have something called model exec at Lyft that does similar. But we have essentially pretty complicated pre-processing that occurs within the model. And to use a serving infrastructure, we would have had to convert all of that pre-processing to Java, which we wanted to avoid. Hi, uh, I, have another, I have two questions, actually. The first one is, uh, you mentioned you have to compute the price for each new hash. But Flink is an event-driven. How do you handle this data sparse situation? Like there's few hash, never have any events. And how do you come up a price? The second question is you mentioned the TensorFlow. Uh, is this actually work uh, out of box with beams? Or do you uh, actually did a lot of uh, hack uh, or some uh, customizations to make it work? Yeah, so with, with respect to sparsity, that is probably the biggest difficulty that we have with machine learning models on geohashes. So the two big things we do to address sparsity is one, having pretty strong default values for these parameterized models that I mentioned, where we'll look back at historical data because it's totally true that a lot of geohashes don't see any events within the current minute. And with respect to TensorFlow working out of the box, like surprisingly, yeah, it did pretty much work out of the box. So a lot of the TensorFlow or whatever code winds up executing C code under the hood. And so then you get into memory management issues sometimes. Did you, you didn't mention any issues with that during your talk. Did, was that anything a problem at all or not? We actually did have a memory management issue unrelated to TensorFlow. 
where there was a, there was a pandas function that had some memory leak, and it turned out to be like a real issue investigated by pandas. But with respect to TensorFlow, we were lucky and didn't deal with any of that. I, I think that point would have been worth mentioning as well. Uh, going from a batch execution style to a long-running Python process is actually challenging. And because it exposes memory leaks and other things that you would not notice otherwise. And we went through that debug and fix cycle to identify what exactly those leaks are. And that was a challenge. So, um, did the constraints of solving a network optimization problem like, like dynamic pricing impose additional complexities on distributing your individual tasks independently since obviously your, your sub-models per geohash have the ability to influence each other? So basically because geohashes influence each other so much, we don't run many models on a per geohash basis unless you consider a model being like averaging some feature. Almost all of our models run on a region basis where a region might be the equivalent of San Francisco. And so by doing that, the models run more slowly, but we can capture the interaction effects in those model executions. A question over there. What, what I understood is uh, the, you have had a Python-based code, so you're trying to move it to the Java to use this uh, interface. What, what is about the new pipelines which you're writing? Is it still you're writing it in Python or you're moved to Java? Uh, so our big goal was to not have to, we essentially wrote no Java code. The, the thing that Beam enabled us to do was write exclusively Python code and even structure what would eventually become a flink graph through the portability framework using only Python. Perhaps to provide a little bit more context on that, um, this is for the pricing use case. Uh, there are many different use cases at Lyft. We, and this is common to other, what other folks say. Uh, we have different, uh, different needs and different solutions for those. So the first uh, part is that SQL is actually very important. And last year there was a talk here at Flink Forward how we address uh, those analytical use cases using declarative ways, not using Python programming. Inside the data uh, platform team, we have several use cases like uh, ingestion pipelines that are generic and that benefit from high performance and can be written in Java where the skill set is there. But in, the, in other teams in Lyft, uh, that, Java, uh, that Java skill and knowledge isn't widespread and uh, they have a lot of experience with Python or they need Python for cases like this. And uh, that's where we are looking at the Python beam route. Okay, I think time is up. Thanks a lot for this really great talk. Um, we now have a 10 minute break for the next sessions to start. <laughs>